All right, everybody. Once again, thank you for joining Entrepreneurial Appetites Black Book Discussions. This is a series of events dedicated to building community, promoting intellectualism, and supporting Black businesses. And as I was telling Professor Rogers uh, before we let you all come on, uh, this, this started as an effort here in San Antonio to support a Black-owned business, Mark's Outings Burger Joint who had uh, put a post on Facebook Live in 2018 about the struggles of his business. And so myself and my good friend, Jason Bailey, were able to get a group of 30, 25 to 30 younger black professionals here in San Antonio together to support this brother's business, but then also have a conversation with a local politician about how we can thrive and support one another as a community here in San Antonio. And so in the midst of COVID-19, we made a hard pivot uh, we had already transitioned into a book club, but now we're able to bring the authors in for the book club conversations. And so uh, we hope that you enjoy today's talk. But before we get into that, um, I want to let you know a little bit about what we do. So those of you who are patrons on Patreon of Entrepreneur Appetite, those of you who made donations to join today's conversation, a percentage of all that you gave goes to an endowment that I started at my alma mater, North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. And so when I think about supporting black businesses, I think about that um, in an expansive way. North Carolina a and is a black institution. And so um, it has been my honor to give back to my alma mater along with two of my friends who were fortunate enough to start at a and for their undergraduate, but were able to progress to get their doctorates in education, which is why we started the From a and to PhD Endowed Scholarship to Support Graduate Students in the College of Education at North Carolina a and Also want to make you all aware that in my, my other role as a university professor, I've collaborated with two of my homeboys from graduate school to start the African Americans in Sport pod class. And you can find that wherever you listen to podcasts, in addition to the Entrepreneur Appetite podcast, um, where we bring conversations from Black professionals and all spec on all aspects of the African American sporting experience. So we have athletes, former athletes, college professors, historians, business people, lawyers, anybody who has had a hand in the sport, of, in, the, in the business of sport, um, is a featured guest on that podcast. And so without further ado, I'm going to stop my screen share, and we're going to turn our attention to uh, Professor Stephen S. Rogers, who is a retired Harvard business professor, and he's the author of two books that we're going to discuss today. Uh, the first one is, we're going to get into, is a letter to my white friends and colleagues, uh, what you can do right now to help the Black community. And then the other one is, our featured text for the day is Successful Black Entrepreneurs, Hidden Histories, Inspirational Stories, and Extraordinary Business Achievements, which was an absolute gem. If y'all can see here, I got my notes that I took as if I was one of the students in his class. And so um, I wanna begin by giving Professor Rogers an opportunity uh, to introduce himself. And just, it's not, it's not every day, you know, that we get an opportunity to talk to someone who is a business professor at Harvard. So before we get into these stories, um, these letters that you've written, tell us your story. How did you get to be where you are and get to do the things that you do. You're still on mute. You're still on mute, Professor Rogers. Well, Professor Clark, this is my absolute pleasure to be here today. I'm coming to you from uh, the suburbs of Chicago, Evanston, Illinois, where Northwestern University is located. Uh, I was born and raised in the south side of Chicago, mm. and I ended up uh, being a professor at Kellogg at Northwestern's business school for 17 years prior to me going to Harvard Business School, where I, my alma mater, where I taught for seven years, and I retired from Harvard Business School in 2019. My path to, to becoming a professor uh, began basically when I graduated from Harvard Business School and I purchased my first company. Um, at that time, I always knew that I wanted to teach, mm. but I also knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I didn't want to teach uh, because I didn't want to go uh, to continuous education to get a PhD. Yeah. So I decided, let me just go ahead and pursue my passion of entrepreneurship. And 
my desire, my, my plan was just to become an entrepreneur and be happy doing that. Mm. But after seven years of entrepreneurship and Professor Clark, I went the entrepreneur route via acquisition. There's three mm. ways that you can become an entrepreneur. You can become an entrepreneur via acquisition, like I did. Um, Reggie Lewis is the most one of the most famous black entrepreneurs who did it, who purchased Beatrice International. Another is um, uh, um, Kathy Hughes, who purchased Radio One um, or created Radio One through a purchase of, of a myriad of radio stations. And even Byron Allen, you know, he purchased yeah. the weather station. Yeah. Um, so there's one way to go to entrepreneur route, and that's via acquisition. And I would really encourage more Blacks to do that route because it's an easier route for finance, quite frankly. It's at less risk. Another way to go the entrepreneur route is via franchise, where you can be a franchisee or a franchisor. Franchisee is a person who buys an ongoing concern that has a history, excuse me, that has a, a, a model already existent. And then you follow those procedures that the franchisor who sells you those rights mm -hmm. to replicate that model. The other, the third way is to do it via startup, where you start up something from nothing. That's the one that has the greatest risk, but it also potentially has the greatest returns. So if you look at what I call the entrepreneurship spectrum, yeah. uh, what you'll see is uh, the description of all three of those ways that you can become an entrepreneur. So I did it via acquisition. And when I was uh, owned the company, I bought my first company when I was 28. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a lampshade manufacturing company. I did a leveraged buyout. I got financing from the Small Business Administration. Um, and the second company, I bought a second company two years after that. And then two years after that, I bought my third company. So what I found was I absolutely love buying companies mm -hmm. and putting management in place and then letting no management run it. So over seven years, I bought, purchased companies and then I ran them. Then after that, I figured the companies in totality were small relative to what I should be doing. They were generating less than 10 million in revenue for the three companies. So I said, if I'm gonna stay in the entrepreneurial area, I need to run something that's 10 times this because uh, as you well know, Professor Clark, the energy and the effort that it takes to run a million dollar or a $10 million company is the same or possibly even less than mm. it is to run a hundred million dollar company because the latter, you have more resources to hire more people right. to do some of the work that you would be doing. Yeah. So I sold the companies and after selling the companies, I came on faculty at Northwestern University at Kellogg School of Management. And that happened because I was a guest speaker in a class and the class was called Small Business Manufacturing. And I was a guest speaker. And after the class, the professor said, by any chance, do you have any interest in to ever teaching? And I said, that's exactly what I was always, that I always wanted to do, mm. but I don't want to go back to get my PhD. So um, he introduced me to the dean, at which time it was Dean Don Jacobs of Kellogg School of Management. The dean said to me, and this was 25 years ago, he said to me, said, Steve, if you were able to teach, what would you like to teach? I said, when I was in business school, my most uh, favorite course was entrepreneurial finance. And he said this to me, um, Professor Langston, he's seven years late. Professor Clark, he said, are you sure this entrepreneurship education thing is not just a fad? Mm. And I said, no, I think it has some legs that it's more than just a sort of a, a fad and that it's gonna be something that is, is more popular. You know, the, the academy was not very embracing of entrepreneurship back in the day. When I was a student, it was very rare for there to be entrepreneurship courses, let alone an entrepreneurship major. It yeah. was viewed that entrepreneurship was vocational and it was beneath the private schools to have such courses in there. And then uh, 25 years ago, as I said, I came to Kellogg and again, it was not, not very prominent. That's why the Dean asked me and queried me as to whether or not I thought it was a fad. Um, so that's how I came on board at Kellogg and I taught entrepreneurial finance while I still own my company. So I taught in our executive programs in the evening, kept my business and then I sold the business. The beauty of selling my business was that, and this is one thing that entrepreneurs are always faced with, if they're gonna sell or get out of business, what am I gonna do next? Yeah. What am I gonna do next? I'm 65 years old, I was 39 years old then or 30, whatever. And my question, what am I gonna do if I sell the business as well? I could actually become a full-time professor and that's what I did. Yeah. So I taught at Kellogg Entrepreneurial Finance. The second year after I taught, I was voted professor of the year. 
I ended up getting selected professor of the year 23 more times after that in the part-time, the full-time in our executive program. Um, I became the director of our entrepreneurship program. And one of the things I'm most proud of is as the director of our entrepreneurship program, we had 16 professors and seven of them were black. Mm. And in our exit- This is at Northwestern. This when I was at Kellogg at Northwestern University. Wow. Okay. Seven of our professors were black that I hired who were uh, um, friends of mine and people that I knew who were business people who had had success. And I would, I would recruit them and they would come to visit my class and speak. And I had one friend who was a venture capitalist. And I said, listen, man, why don't you come? Because I don't have enough bandwidth to teach the demand that I have for my course, Entrepreneurial yeah. Finance. Why don't you teach that course as well? So he did it. Um, he ended up loving it. He stayed there with me at Kellogg, became a full-time professor. Now he's the Dean of Business School at Chicago State University. So um, entrepreneurship education was very, very popular at the school such that when we did exit interviews of our students out of the, I think 14 different disciplines that were there, uh, the students always ranked the entrepreneurship department as the number one student. So when students used to come into the entrepreneurship department and we had face, uh, uh, um, photos of all of the professors, they would say, this looks like the Afro-Am department right here. Right. And um, the coolest thing was not only were we uh, brilliant, but we were brilliant and we were representing the black folks. And then as one professor, and I'll close with this, we used to teach, the, um, used to host the National Football League and National Basketball Association with special programs at Kellogg. And I used to run those programs. And one of the things that the athletes, and we would have about 20, 25 uh, NFL players at a time in a cohort. And one of the things that they said was they loved coming to the Kellogg program because we, the program was at Kellogg, Stanford, Harvard Business School, and Wharton. They said yeah. they loved coming to the Kellogg program because me, the director, is Black. But they said, but then he has all of these other Black professors, and they teach the hard stuff. They teach finance. Yeah. So it was a great compliment to us. So my career has been one where I've been a practitioner in the entrepreneurial world, where I actually, uh, um, as I say, I walked in the real shoes of the entrepreneur, and then I pivoted and moved into the academic arena where I get the greatest joy in my life from teaching people who, that I say are my personal heroes and sheroes because entrepreneurs who are successful, um, they do well for themselves, they create jobs for other people, and people who have other jobs are self-sufficient and healthy. Yeah. So since we were talking about it, I have a question because I've, I've been thinking about this in my role as a university professor. Now I'm in the College of Education, which for those of you who are in the audience don't know, the College of Ed and the College of Business are like this. We are like on opposite ends of the spectrum for university. College of Business is like on the top, School of Ed is like on the bottom, okay? <laughs> we are on the bottom. Yeah. And it's between us and like 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 uh, liberal arts or whatever, like uh, or history or, or religion. Yeah, something like yeah, all those. Like we like at the bottom. So this this I've I've been pondering this for a while. Like I feel like I feel like every every college within a university needs some entrepreneurship track. So, and I, I just want to get your 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 thoughts on that. I know it's not in the questions that. That I sent you ahead of time, but no, that's fine. That's it, it, fine. it seems like I, I think you talk about 20, 25 years ago, entrepreneurship wasn't the thing on college campuses. It's like now no. everybody's got a side hustle. Oh, absolutely. You're, influencer, absolutely. you're doing this. So, like, how do you think business should be expanded, you know, throughout throughout the university, throughout the university setting? Right. Well, I think business and entrepreneurship in particular should be a part of almost every school, the school of education, the school, uh, the, the uh, school of religion, uh, the, the law school, the, the, uh, the engineering school, because entrepreneurs are in all of those fields and all of those disciplines. Yeah. And one of the things that I found was when I taught at Kellogg, um, my classes were oversubscribed. And oftentimes my classes, 10% of my class would be filled with students from uh, the School of Education, the School of Music, um, the medical school, uh, the dental school, the, the law school. And so what I found was the de desire and the, 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 the thirst for entrepreneurship crossed disciplines in terms yeah. of academic disciplines. Yeah. 
When I was at Harvard Business School, I created a new course called Black Business Leaders and Entrepreneurship in response to the dearth of case studies that had Black protagonists. Um, you know, at Harvard Business School, we very rarely use books, textbooks. Most of our classes are taught via case studies. Mm -hmm. And case studies are basically stories about a business person who has a challenge. The challenge may be in marketing, finance, operations. And what we do is we expect the students to read the story and then come up with a solution to the problem. And um, the, every story or every case study has a protagonist. And Harvard makes probably $150,000, uh, $150 million a year, generates about $150 million a year of a revenue on selling case studies to other business schools throughout the world. 80% yeah. of case studies used in other business schools are produced at Harvard Business School. Um, and But there was a dearth of them that had black protagonists. And we have in the Harvard Business School library probably 10,000 case studies and less than 50 of them had black protagonists. Yeah. So I created the course, um, Black Business Leaders on Entrepreneurship, and I wrote 27 case studies that had black protagonists because I wanted my students to read about the brilliance of black men and women who were successful as well. But to your question, there you go right there. I just there. want to note that a lot of those case studies are in this book. There, yes, they so, are. Go ahead, those continue, I'm sorry. Studies, those case studies that I mentioned are in the book. Um, there's, I, I have written more case studies than any other professor in the world that have black protagonists, mm. okay? Um, and what I did with Harvard Business School when creating that course, what I found was, again, this thirst on the part of students even outside of the business school to learn about entrepreneurship. My course at Harvard Business School was one that had students who cross-registered from 14, excuse me, from 12 of Harvard's 14 schools. Mm -hmm. So I had students from the business school, the law school, the medical school, the engineering school, the divinity school. My favorite students, Professor Clark, came from the ed school. The students from Harvard's education school was so woke that they had this beautiful consciousness about helping people, but at the same time, they wanted to learn about entrepreneurship, which I would tell them is something that should be, it's, it's perfect to meld the two because I believe good entrepreneurs help people by helping them get jobs. Yeah. But the, I love the students from the education school because when I asked a, a friend of mine, I said, what is it about my love affair with the education school? He said, you like them because they are people who have devoted their lives to uplifting other people. And so they embody those traits already. And then I got the chance to teach these brilliant students the fundamentals of entrepreneurship and the fundamentals of finance, which was perfect. When I retired from Harvard Business School, yeah. prior to it, I'd actually met with the dean of the education school mm -hmm. to ask her if I could come over there and teach for one year and full time because Again, the students from the education uh, school were my favorite students. And in my classes, all of my students were black, um, except one. And the white student, that one white student, you know, he thought I was too conservative. He, he wanted me mm. to have a revolution yeah, in the class. Yeah, 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 okay? yeah. But that was all right, cool. But I had such a joy of teaching with teaching um, these brilliant black men and women, the fundamentals of finance, so much so that when I retired, I said, I want to do this again. So I went on a tour of HBCUs and I toured, it was during the year before the COVID. Yeah. And I was planning to go to 12 different HBCUs and to do a workshop, 90 minute workshop on um, entrepreneurial finance for black entrepreneurs. And I did it at Morgan State, um, Stillman College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I did it at Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina. I didn't do it at North Carolina a and because they didn't invite me to come. I reached out to them and said, I'll come for free. All you uh, have to do is, yeah, all, all you have to do is just simply give me a classroom and publicize it to the students. I'll, I'll, pay, I'll pay for my own uh, transportation. I will buy food for it as well. A black company, um, REL Investments, uh, owned by John Rogers and Melody Hobson, they were the sponsors. So I flew to uh, Spelman College. I went to Bethune Cookman in Florida as well. Um, and I got the joy of 
of teaching these brilliant black men and women the stuff that I was teaching uh, predominantly white students uh, prior to that for 17 years. And so um, I've just been really blessed to have had the opportunity to teach entrepreneurial finance in particular to black people. And I absolutely love teaching them. Yeah. So um, uh, we've got a little bit about your biography and we're going to talk about the successful black entrepreneurs book. But first, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about uh, the letter to your white friends and colleagues. And so you may not remember this, but we had a dialogue back and forth when, when I first asked you to be on the, on the podcast. And um, you had insisted on this book being part of the discussion. And I was reluctant because um, my radical self is just like, you know, we always, we centering white people again. However, there are some really, you make some really good points right. in this book. Right. And so could you share with us some of the points? I think it's the, the last two chapters or so um, about reparations, but then also about supporting Black businesses and um, anything else that you want to share about the importance right. and why you decided to, to write this book. Right. If I had to do it all over again, Professor Clark, I would retitle the book. And that mm. would be what you can do now to help the Black community subtitle a letter to my white friends and colleagues, okay? Because a lot of people get caught up in the title, a letter to my white friends and colleagues. Right. I think it is a letter to them, right. but the reality is yeah. the real focus is on how can you help the black community, okay? Right. And now it's targeting a white audience though. Yeah. And the reason yeah. is because it's sort of like the guy said, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. That's right. And so it targets yeah. a white audience because they have the money. And let me say this, Professor Clark, you are as radical as I am. I, I am a race man, an old school vernacular. My entire life is devoted to the uplifting of the poor Black community. Yeah. Okay? So the reality, though, is that we are a people who have been intentionally a hurt. And we've yeah. been hurt. Um, and people talk about, well, don't, don't try not to pursue or, or allege that you're a victim. We've been a victim. And what we know is in the courts, victim gets, victims get paid. Yeah. So I try to encourage Black people, do not refrain from acknowledging the fact that we've been victimized intentionally. We were victimized by 246 years of slavery, which in essence, if you think about that, 246 years of slavery and being enslaved, um, that was 18 generations where white people were able to transfer wealth from one generation to the other, during that same period of time, Black people were not able to transfer any wealth. Right. I know, for example, that my great-great-grandfather was born into slavery in Virginia in, mm -hmm. 1860, in 18, um, 1853. I've had a genealogist now that my daughter hired to do a family tree tracing of our family. She gave it to me for Father's Day, at which time I learned that my great, great, great grandfather was enslaved and his son was enslaved as well because he was born in 1863 and was, we well know, 13th Amendment um, was passed in 1865. But for that period of time, what was going on was economic um, development for white people. In essence, the federal government was subsidizing wealth creation for white people at that time. And it was intentionally, uh, intentionally of seeking to impoverish Black people, and it was successful. And then that was followed by 60 years of Black codes, where Black people were arrested for, for the most menial things, like walking on the wrong side of the street or whistling while walking. And they were arrested, and they were in, ended up being victims of convict leasing, where states would arrest Black people for these menial crimes. And then if Black people couldn't pay the uh, penalty for the, the fine, the states would actually sell their services to a private company like uh, a state, U.S. Steel, um, who would buy their services for a year, pay the state the money, and then the Black person would have to work for that company for a year to pay off their fine. People don't know that that existed during that time, yeah. and that was called Black Codes. During that period of time, if a Black person was, invected, uh, was, was uh, um, uh, arrested for such a crime, if they had a, black, a daughter or a son, their daughter or son was indentured to a white family if there was a male until he was 18, until he, if it was a female until 21, got no compensation. So even after slavery ended, we had this other institution called uh, uh, Black Codes that was slavery by another name 
where black people, and it was all done just like slavery, it wasn't done just simply because white yeah. people don't like black people, it was done for economic prosperity. States like Louisiana, 92% of their annual budget came from uh, convict leasing. And then that was followed by 40 years of redlining where the federal mm. government literally said, we're going to create a middle class in America. You know, uh, Professor Clark, after the Second World War, for the most part, America was two different worlds. It was the, the rich and it was the poor. There was no middle class, yeah. okay? Um, but President Roosevelt said, we need to create a middle class. So prior to the end of the Second World War, there was virtually no such thing as a home mortgage. You either, and the mortgages that did exist were only five years. Only the wealthy could get the mortgage. So President Roosevelt said, we, what we're going to do is we're going to create a middle class by creating and encouraging banks to give this new financial security called a 30-year mortgage. So the federal government said to the banks throughout the country, they said, if you give a 30-year mortgage to customers, we will guarantee 80% of that mortgage. So with that, banks went out and started giving mortgages to people that never could have had mortgages before. Mm. But there's a caveat. And the federal government said, those mortgages guarantees can be given to everybody, but they were not to be given to Negroes. Professor Clark, this was not subtle statements. This was not obfuscated statements. These were explicit statements in writing that yeah, the government yeah. mandated that the banks could not give federal government guarantees to black people. And so the result was banks like the Bank of Italy, they flooded the Italian community with mortgages um, for allowing Italians to buy homes. Black people couldn't get those homes. Um, the Bank of Italy was so prosperous and mortgages then and mortgages today, Professor Clark, are one of the most profitable things that banks can give. So the Bank of Italy prospered so much that the Bank of Italy back in the day has transformed into the Bank of America today, mm -hmm. okay? But America's literally, and if you think about what I'm saying is, the federal government said to, uh, um, to the banks, we're going, we want you to draw a circle around certain communities. We want you to use the color green around communities that are considered safe communities. Those communities that were considered safe communities are white communities. We want you to draw a red line around the communities that you that are considered unsafe. Those communities were black communities. That's how they were defined, by the race of the people there. Sometimes a red line would be drawn around a white community that could be close in proximity to a black community. And But that's what redlining was. And, they, mm. and the federal government said, you're not to give guaranteed mortgage guarantees to people in those red line communities. So black people were intentionally impoverished by the federal government, but at the same time, think about this, the federal government was enriching the white people. So slavery, black codes and redlining all was designed to enrich white people and impoverish black people. And you know what happened? It worked. It the is. result is today, a third of all black people have zero net worth. The reality is we're a poor people. No, we're not a poor people because we don't work hard. We're a poor people because whites were given subsidies. Whites didn't work harder than us. Whites are not smaller, smarter than us. They were given those subsidies that I've mentioned. And one scholar, he concluded that if you stop white wealth creation right now, it would take black people 225 years to catch up. Yeah. And the reason is because as one person said, it's a perfect example of sometimes it's better in many instances to get a head start than it is to run fast. There's nothing that we can do to catch up, almost nothing, except get reparations, okay? Mm -hmm. And the reality is the federal government did this intentionally to us. And so we could talk about if we save, if we only spend money with Black, that'll never allow us to catch up. The reality is this, the average white person who dropped out of high school has a greater net worth than the average black person who has a college degree. So what we see from those facts is education is not the great equalizer. It's not. So what I say in this book is, and I, as I said about this, this book, this book is targeting a white audience and it's targeting white people who have a logical mind and a kind heart, who understand the facts that I just cited. And those facts that I just cited are in the book. They can't be refuted. These are facts, okay? Yeah. And so what I say to those well-intentioned white folks, 
This is what you can do if you want to help the black community. You can do four things. One is put money in a black owned bank. Okay, specifically deposit 9.21%, 9 9.21% of your annual de deposit dollars in a black owned bank. Uh, why why 9.21%? That represents the time that Officer Chauvin had his knee on George Floyd's neck, nine minutes mm. and 21 mm. seconds. Uh, why put it in a black bank? What we know is black owned banks will send money to the black community. We know that black owned banks, 75% of the mortgages they give go to black people, whereas half a percent of mortgages by white owned banks go to black people. And black owned banks can't survive just off of black people. We're a poor people. So if you, you're waiting just getting money from black people and for people who don't have a lot of money, they put small amounts of money in the bank, then they take it out a lot, right? Yeah. Because they need to live day to day. The result of that is what? The bank incurs higher expenditures, higher costs, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. So what we need is we need money that goes into black owned banks and it stays there, okay? It stays there for three, five years, or seven years, which white people have the money to do that, okay? Um, the second thing I recommend is that uh, people, white people uh, donate 9.21% of their money to historically black colleges and universities. You're a product of that. And what we know is we know the 101 HBCUs that have 300,000 students. We know that they do what, in the words of Hannah Jones, uh, the Pulitzer Prize winner who wrote 1619 or who led 1619 Project, we know they punch above their weight class. Yeah, we know yeah. that 90% of all black judges today attended an HBCU, 50% of all black lawyers attended an HBCU. 50% of all black engineers attended an HBCU. These schools have done a Herculean task with very small budgets. We know the average endowment for an HBCU is a mere $12 million, okay? Uh, but we also know that over 70% of the students at HBCUs receive Pell Grants. To receive a Pell Grant, that means you come from a household that has an average household income of $26,000 or less, okay? So HBCUs are educating those of our people who come from the most, uh, most challenging financial situations. Um, in contrast, white schools, only like 17% of those students uh, go to, uh, excuse me, qualify for Pell Grants. So our HBCUs desperately need more money. And so I'm asking whites to donate 9.21% of their annual philanthropic dollars to an HBCU. And let me just tell you this, everything that I recommended, I've done. My HBCU dollars go to Bennett College, the other uh, uh, all-female black college down in Greensboro, North Carolina. Small, uh, small, beautiful campus uh, with about um, less than a thousand students. Uh, but my my philanthropic dollars go goes to them, and then it goes to Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and then the third thing I recommend is that you do spend at least 9.21 percent of your annual budget with black-owned businesses. And the reason is because black owned businesses create jobs for black people. We have empirical data and research that shows that a black owned business will hire black people if the black owned business is in a black community or if it's in a white community. Conversely, we have research that shows white owned businesses, even if it's in a black community, will not necessarily hire black people. Yeah. This was research done by a white scholar by the name of Dr. Timothy Bates. His book is called banking on black enterprise. And what he mm. says is we need more black owned businesses and we need them to grow because they will create jobs for black people. And then finally, my recommendation is that, and let me just say this, mm -hmm. on an annualized basis, I probably spend about 50% of my annual, annual budget with black owned businesses. I uh, love black owned restaurants. So everybody knows if you come to Chicago, you wanna have a meal with me, we're gonna to go to a black restaurant for breakfast. We're gonna to go to a black restaurant for dinner. I probably have gonna to been to more black restaurants than anybody in the country, okay? When I travel the country, I Google black owned restaurants and I go to those black owned restaurants because it's a way for me to put money in the black community, okay? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, my, 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 my laundry service is a black owned business. I get fruit delivered to me every week from a black owned company called 40 Acres that, 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 that hires uh, black folks. Um, my 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 attorney is a black owned, black law firm. My accounting firm is a black law firm. I'm not talking about black people who work for white firms. I'm mm -hmm. talking about black companies that hire black people and send money to the black community. So the final recommendation 
that I give in the book is that the, I'm asking whites to send a letter to their Congress people supporting reparations, that we as black people are entitled to reparations. Um, there's never been anything done uh, to, to, to compensate us for the things that I mentioned earlier, 246 years of slavery, 60 years of black codes, 40 years of redlining. Um, the only thing that was ever done, Professor Clark, that was close to giving black people reparations in America was following the Civil War uh, as General Sherman was marching through Savannah, defeating the Confederates. He was marching through Savannah with his Union soldiers and he was marching through Savannah. Uh, black people were leaving the plantations in Georgia and following the troops. And General Sherman sent a letter to President Lincoln. He said, I have all of these Negroes following me. What should I do with them? President Lincoln said, ask those Negroes, what do they want? And I'm quoting, ask them, what do they want? So General Sherman reached Savannah, convened a meeting in a five-star hotel with 20 black clergy. All of them were male. Some of them had been enslaved. Some of them had been free men. Some mm -hmm. of them were as old as 70 years old. Some of them as young as 24 years old. He asked them two primary questions. He said, what do you want when you're free? It was unanimous, Professor Clark. They said, we want land. We want to be able to take care of ourselves. Then this was the second question. He said, do you want it separately or do you want it amongst whites? It was not a plurality. It was not a unanimous uh, voice then. Some said we wanted to integrate. Some said, no, we want it separately because we can't trust whites not to be prejudiced. So with that um, meeting, General Sherman left that meeting, contacted President Lincoln, and then they created what's called Special Order Number 15. Mm. Special Order Number 15 said, we're going to take 400 acres from these Confederate soldiers who we're going to convict, okay, for, of sedition and treason. We're going to hang some of these MFs, okay, because of their treason. And this, if you think about it, this is what should be done for Muslim from January 6th. Yeah. But they said, we're going to take the 400 million acres from them, and we're going to partition it in, 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 in lots of 40 acres. And what we're going to do is we're not going to give it to the new freedmen, the new 4 million freedmen. We're going to sell it to them at $1.25 an acre. Okay? Um, and we're going to do it long term. All they, they need to put up 25%, and then we'll finance the other. Um, General Sherman and General, General Howard, who is, that's Howard University is named mm -hmm. after, yeah. started implementing that. They actually started giving some of the land to some of the new free black people. President Lincoln gets murdered by John Booth. After he gets murdered, his vice president, Andrew J Jackson, um, succeeds him. And he says very immediately, and he's a former slave owner himself. He says, it is unfair to whites to give this land to blacks. Let them earn it. And so he rescinded special order number 15. That was the only effort in which there was any evidence of mm. reparations being given to blacks. And that, as you well know, is what we all know today as the denying of us the 40 acres and a mule. The, yeah. the mules were old mules. They were old beaten down mules that they were just gonna give to black folks for the 40 acres. But there's precedent. There's precedent for America giving reparations to people. And that is in the second world war, America imprisoned or they call it intern, 120,000 Japanese Americans, because they said, we cannot trust them to be loyal because we're fighting Japan. Now be mindful, Professor Clark, as you well know, we were also fighting Italy and we were yeah. also fighting Germany, but they didn't intern German Americans or Italian Americans. They just did the internship of people of color, specifically Asian Americans, Japanese Americans, 120,000 of them were held in intern camps with rifles over them. They were taken from their homes and everything. And then they were released after two years. Under President Reagan, um, reparations were paid to 80,000 of those people. Mm -hmm. And each one of those 80,000 people received a check from the federal government to the tune of $20,000 for being interned for 20 years, for two years. So there's evidence of reparations occurring by the United States. And my recommendation is, I'm asking people, send a letter encouraging your congressman to vote for reparations. A template of the letter is in, in the book. And um, that's the only way that we can catch up with white folks. And my recommendation is that the reparations specifically should be for the amount of 
$153,000, which is the difference between white net worth today. The average white family has net worth of about $170,000. The average black family has net worth of $17,000. That's a delta of $153,000. I say that black people who are 18 years and older should get a check, one check from the federal government for $153,000. That would cost the federal government $3 trillion, which is $1 trillion less than the federal government paid to bail out the banks. Mm. Our overall economy annually is about $21 trillion. We could afford this, okay? Yeah. So that's why the book is saying to my white colleagues, the book is a call to action and specifically helps white people very clearly do what they ask to do. And that is, how can I help the black community? Yeah. So I, I think about the time that it was written, uh, you know, midst COVID, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. And I feel like there was three types of black folk that I saw. There was black folk who were going to white folk. There were black folk who were going to black folk. And there were black folk who were like going to both and maybe some more diverse communities. And what I appreciate about the work that you did is that this book came out after that one, but it's based upon work that you've been doing for years. So it's not like you just decided that I'm gonna write this letter to white folk now, right? Mm -hmm. This is a collection of essays and case studies that have been integrated into your, to your work as a, as a professor. And so um, I learned about so many entrepreneurs that I had no idea about before. That's right. That's right. And I just want to highlight something that you said to previously that's in this book, that when black businesses exist, they hire black people and they hire people of color. Like, like we do the work. And I think that's 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 what makes this book important. That's what makes uh, the need for black businesses important. And there's a number of different topics that you talk about. There's there's certainly some deep history and we can get into that. But I just, I just want to run through a quick outline, right? So you talk about startups. You talk about acquisitions, which is the work that you had done. You talk about franchising, which is something that you mentioned already. We talked about access to capital, um, turnaround entrepreneurs, selling your company, and then becoming an entrepreneur. I think we hear a lot about access to capital. And that's not to say that everyone knows about you know, the limitations that we have in terms of accessing capital and things like that. But I think we, I think we have less knowledge as a community about acquisitions, as you said, right? But then also, I think somewhat parallel to being an acquisition is like being a turnaround entrepreneur. And so if you could talk about why it's important for Black entrepreneurs to consider buying businesses as an option for entrepreneurship, in particular, you mentioned Reginald Lewis. And so if you could talk about his significance and him being an archetype, right, for what it means to be an acquisition entrepreneur. Yeah, Reggie, Reginald Lewis, and God rest his soul, good brother, um, trained as an attorney, um, went on Wall Street, worked for Wall Street, and worked for a large law firm. And then he decided, and he wrote a book called Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? Yeah. The book is about 30 years old now, sort of one of my Bibles. And the book was referring to the fact that Black people should emulate white people in the sense that we should buy businesses just like white people buy businesses. So Reggie Lewis, he did his first acquisition uh, of a, a small $2 million company called Beatrice, excuse me, called McCall Sewing Pattern. It was a company that he did a leverage buyout. Leverage buyout means, leverage means debt. So he financed the business with primarily debt. He grew the business and then he sold it. He made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And Wall Street recognized this black man is doing something great. And so um, I forget, I can't, I'm having a brain freeze right now, but uh, 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 Milken, uh, who was on Wall Street, um, one of the leaders of um, Drexel Lambert Bur Burnham, he reached out to Reggie Lewis. He said, you know, how, why don't we do a deal together? Why don't we help you finance something that's much bigger? The deal that they did was Beatrice International, which was a billion dollar deal. 
Um, it was a leveraged buyout, primarily with debt financing. Reggie Lewis bought Beatrice International after buying McCall Sewing Pattern. Just think about this. Yeah. He buys a little company, $2 million. His next deal is a billion dollars. And what you can learn from that, my friends, is once you know it's buying and running businesses can be like swimming. If you can swim in five feet of water, you can swim in 5,000 feet of water, mm -hmm. okay? The same with a business. If you can run a $2 million business, you can run a $5 million business, a $50 million business, a $500 million, a billion dollar business. You will learn those fundamentals are transferable and the only differences are the zeros. And as I mentioned to you before, as the business gets larger, it typically might become easier, maybe more stressed because you have more debt, but it might become easier because you now have the financial resources to hire more people yeah. to do most of the work. So I did my first deal, as I stated, all three of my businesses were acquisitions. And the reason I went the entrepreneur route via acquisition was because there was nothing that I wanted to start up. Um, and in terms of franchising, I actually trained at McDonald's. And I think you read that in my book. I trained at McDonald's for two years to buy a McDonald's franchise. And then after two years, I left because I was not going to get enough independence. Mm -hmm. And so what I concluded was I didn't want to start up something from scratch because there was no problem that I knew how to solve, that I was uh, very good at. But what I knew was I, I was a good manager. So I said, I'm going, to, I'm going to emulate Reggie Lewis and I'm going to buy my own business. And so I encourage Black people that to, to do that because one of the benefits of that, several benefits, one is you already have an existing customer base. You have a proven business model. And the third thing is, and typically it has cash flow that should be available to service the debt that you're going to take on. But it should be easier to get financing because of those things that I just mentioned. It has a history. It has cash flow. So it's easier to finance that than a business that's a startup that does not have history, does not have a, 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 a customer base at, at, all, at, at all. So an acquisition is so much easier and the beauty of an acquisition, if you did one, if you got bank financing, you should be able to service your debt in five to seven years, such that after five or seven years, you don't owe the bank anymore. Then it's your business to do what you want. So I think more, more of us need to go the acquisition route because one is the success rate is higher. Two is we need more Black entrepreneurs and success via startups, most entrepreneurs will fail, okay? Um, for, for acquisitions, that's not the case, though, because it has a history. The only problem that you have when you do an acquisition is that you pay too much for it. Right. And so therefore, can the debt be serviced by the cash flow? So that's one thing that we want to put on people's mind and encourage them to do. The other is, think about if you have the management experience. To focus on buying, for example, an existing business that is underperforming. And that, in that case, you would be a turnaround focus, turnaround specialist. Yeah. And the beauty of buying a, a business that's underperforming is the cost is very low. And mm. so you can buy something that has a much lower cost than a business that's performing well. But if you do like Don Cornwell, he's a black man who decided, I'm going to buy underperforming television stations. And what Don Cornwell defined as an underperforming television station, for example, was television stations that had EBITDA cash flow of less than 25%. The well-performing television stations had cash flow of 25%. So Don Cornwell was looking for businesses that had cash flow of 5%, 7%. And his position was, I can turn those businesses around. I can buy the business and I can get them to perform better by operating much better, okay? And then if I get them to perform better, Look at that difference. If they're performing a 7% profit now, and I can get them up to the industry average of 25%, look at that 18% difference. That's yeah. my capital gain. That's where my value comes from right there. So doing a, a, a turnaround business is also very attractive, but it can be tough now. It is not for the faint of heart. Typically mm -hmm. a business is, you, you know, you're looking at a, a business that's not performing well because it has a problem of some kind. The problem could be the industry, the problem could be management. The problem could be uh, the lack of capital. Um, so your job as a turnaround is to do that. You know, Professor Clark, I love real estate. And mm. 
the real estate that I own a real estate company, residential real estate company here in Chicago. The, the, the real estate that I buy, I like buying homes in working class, poor, low income black communities that are that looks like they're, 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 they should be abandoned. Yeah. I like to buy the eyesores. I'm a turnaround guy. I buy homes for as little as $5,000. I put $100,000 into that home and then I sell it for $125,000, $140,000. I'm a turnaround guy. I know how to turn homes around. So I know I wanna, how to I, I, I want to add though, right? I, I want to add something because what, what you said was important. You'll buy a $5,000 home. You put $100,000 into it. You'll sell it for like $100,000, $125,000. That's still affordable. You, know right. what I mean? you like, hit it right on the head. That's, that's, why I buy, that's why I target that community because my job and my life's work is to help the black community. So you hit it right on the head. It's still affordable. Someone bought a house at $125,000. I got a house now to sell it for $150,000. Okay, we're going to close on it on Friday. Um, the mortgage that that person is going to pay for that three-bedroom, beautiful home, and my, my model was suburban quality housing in the, in the black community. Mm. So they're going to end up paying $150,000 for it. Their mortgage is going to be about $1,100 a month. They're presently paying uh, $1,500 a month for rent. Yeah. Okay? They're getting a house. And as a result of that, uh, the value of that house should increase 4 to 7% a year. Um, and so they're building equity in that instance right there. But I'm a turnaround guy. I like getting homes in the Black community and beautifying the Black community. I think you you answered the question I was going to ask you, because when I when my assumption for turnarounds was one I know the business is bad right or underperforming, but I almost want like this principle of turnaround. If we apply that to a black business or a black institution that is underperforming, how do you do that and not become the bad guy? Like we, right, yeah. It, it could be a church. It could be a church. It could be an HBCU. It could be a uh, you know, some businesses that are staples in a community, right. but you just, you got people who work, they don't really do nothing. Like, you know, like, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you do the turnaround? Like you're, you're a black person, you're trying to build up black community. You want to turn around this, this icon of a business or institution everybody loves, but it's not doing what it should do, but you don't want to be the bad guy either. How do you, how do you negotiate that? Well, one is you better have tough skin, mm. thick skin. Um, turnaround is not for the faint hearted, mm. even if it's not that element that you just described in the black community. Now, ideally, I'm one who believes, I don't believe in what's called um, low grade capitalism. I don't believe that, um, I don't believe in the type of capitalism that says my only obligation is to my uh, investor. Mm. I believe that there are multiple stakeholders when you're engaged in business, when you're engaged in entrepreneurship, those multiple stakeholders include, and now we teach that at Harvard Business School now. When I was a student there 35, 40 years ago, that our, we used to teach that your only focus and your only obligation, your fiduciary responsibility is to your shareholders. Mm. Now we teach something differently. And that is that there's a multiplicity of stakeholders that you should answer to. Those stakeholders include your investors, they include the community where your business is located, they include your customers, they include your employees, they include uh, your neighbors. So to the, when you think like that, when you go into communities and you have this holistic mindset, in my opinion, what you can become is you actually can become the hero if you're respective and yeah. respect those stakeholders. As I mentioned to you, you know, I go into communities where, um, Things look bad and the houses look horrible and everything. And I've literally had guys, for example, stand on the corner. They come across the street. They sit on my porch. I befriend them. And I say, come on, man. Okay. Now, I'm not going to, you know, I befriend them. And then I have conversations with them, talk about their lives and everything like that. The next thing you know, they're sitting up there saying, you know what? We're no longer going to come sit on your property. I said, thank you, man. I'm All I'm trying to do is rehab this property to sell it so I can bring something good to this neighborhood, okay? Um, but I hire people from the community. Um, 
At one time last year, I had 50 employees in my real estate company. We were rehabbing. Uh, I had four teams of, of engine, uh, electricians, HVAC experts, plumbers, and carpenters. 75% um, of them were Black. The other 25% were Latino. I'm very, very Black conscious, OK? Yeah. Um, so I hire Black people. So when you come to see my properties and you come to see my work, it's the same as when I own companies. I employ Black people. Um, so when you come, what you see is this is a guy who walks the talk. So I employ Black people. I buy products from Black-owned companies. Um, I use Black professional service firms to do my work. Um, and so I become a hero in those communities. And, and that's what I would say everybody can be when they're doing turnaround. And that is, if you're respectful of all of the stakeholders, mm. okay, and you're not practicing low down capitalism, which says you're willing to, 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 to sacrifice some of your profit margins for the benefit of the community, you'll win if you recognize all of the stakeholders and you're willing to make some sacrifices. I'm not trying to maximize my monetary returns mm -hmm. with the work that I do. My first obligation is, first of all, I need to keep the company afloat. Secondly, I need the company to be profitable but I don't need to make as much money as I possibly can make. I'll sacrifice a little margin so that I can hire two extra people, okay? I mentioned to you, I get fruit delivered every Monday to my house. It's delivered by a black owned company called 40 Acres. 40 Acres, they hire people who are chronically un unemployed, black people mm. who are chronically unemployed. I could go to the grocery store to get my fruit. Man. I order from 40 Acres because they're employing people, okay? So part of my life is dedicated to using my resources, my contact, and my financial resource to help uplift the Black community. So I think if you have that in mind, yeah, you'll be all right. Now you're gonna get you're gonna get burned a couple of times, but that's a that's part of it, though. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned Kathy Hughes, and I, th I think in a lot of she was mentioned throughout the book, um, and her how how she was able to do. What, what the, the gentleman who worked in television was able to do with radio stations to grow uh, TV one and radio one and, and all of that. There's an interesting story in the um, turnaround chapter and it's the tattered cover bookstore oh, in Denver. Yeah, Colorado. And that, man, that thing just, it stood out to me powerfully. Talk about how that brother was able to go in there. And so I, I want this is what stood out to me with that. I sometimes assume that a black owned business has a certain black aesthetic. When I think about a black books, black owned bookstore, I'm thinking it's got like, you, you know, uh, they came before the Mayflower, you know, Francis Crest Welsings, you know, ISIS papers, like all the, like yeah, all of the, the whole tap. I don't want to say whole tap because all the black, black stuff, you know what I mean? But this isn't the case with this, with this, particular bookstore. Can you tell a little bit about that story and how yeah. um, that well, one, one, to, to your point, we as business people have to be opportunistic. Mm. And sometimes, and historically, most of our entrepreneurs had businesses that primarily had success off of the Black community. Mm. What has happened over time is white businesses have decided they're going to uh, access the black community for business. So we can no longer necessarily just focus on our own community yeah. for our success. You know, when I did my acquisition of the Lampshade Manufacturing Company, which is a case study, it was Fincher Lampshade Company. I didn't have one black customer. Mm. All of my customers were department stores throughout the United States, but my employees were black, uh, but none of my customers were black. And so I bought the business because it was a well-run business. Uh, the cash flow was strong. I could service the debt. And my thought was, I get a chance to own this business. I can employ Black people. I can make donations to Black philanthropic organizations. But none of my customers are Black because none of my customers, uh, none of the Black people own uh, major department stores that I was primarily selling to. But I could use it to send my money there. The same with this, this bookstore, Tattered Bookstore in Colorado. It was a very successful bookstore, white-owned. Um, and after George Floyd was murdered, um, the owners who fancied themselves as white liberals, um, they 
decided they did not want to make a statement around um, supporting equity. They felt that as liberals, white liberals, that their work was already speaking for itself. And they got some major pushback from their employees, most of whom were white, mm. 99%. So um, they started getting a lot of pressure to white owners. And the result, long story short, was they ended up selling the bookstore because they were being shunned and told that a lot of their employees were going to quit, and leave. These are white employees who were mad at the white folks for not supporting black people. Um, the bookstore was sold to a young black to a young black man, a young brother who went to Harvard Business School, who bought the company, and he got financing from um, uh, uh, white financiers in Colorado. Um, but the bookstore is one that, and I spoke to him. The bookstore is one that the primary customer base is white but it's mm. a black owned bookstore. And when I spoke to him, quite frankly, when I pu published my book, a letter to my white friends and colleagues, and it was published on May 25th, 2021, a year after George Floyd's murder. Wow. Um, that bookstore was the first to host me with a webinar, mm. okay? Um, because the black bookstore owner said, I want to uh, showcase and highlight more black uh, authors. And so, uh, the the interviewer, just like yourself, Professor Clark, but it was a white woman who interviewed yeah. me about this. So it was a story about uh, Black business ownership that happened as a result of whites being unhappy with white business owners in a predominantly white community and the Black guy taking that over. And we got to get comfortable. You know, it can be tough sometimes when we think about being Black and having customers that aren't just simply Black. Uh, because one of the things I write about in my book, Successful Black Entrepreneurs, because one of my white colleagues at Harvard Business School asked me one time, why do we need a course titled Black Business Leaders and Entrepreneurship? Why not just a course on entrepreneurship? He said, how are Black entrepreneurs different from white entrepreneurs? I said two ways. One is white entrepreneurs can access capital. Black entrepreneurs yeah. can't. Okay. Two is White entrepreneurs never have to try to hide themselves. Black entrepreneurs are always wrestling with, should they engage in what I call racial concealment? Should they make it, should they actively try to mask the fact that the company is black owned? So we see that's the case with, and I give an example of that with Robert Smith, owns one of the most wealthiest black people in the country. Yes, He's the one who paid the donation to uh, Morehouse University paying for those students' tuition. But his private equity firm, he says he didn't put his face on his website because he didn't want white people to look and see that it was a black uh, general partner and decide not to do business with him. Yeah. That's not a problem that white people face. Mm -hmm. We face it. And a story that sort of highlights that is um, Sears Roebuck and Company. You know, Sears, um, back in the day, it was the Amazon of its day. Yeah. There used to be a jingle that said Sears has everything, and Sears did indeed have everything. Sears, you know, they used to sell houses, and they had mortgages. My grandparents uh, were denied a mortgage because of redlining. They finally did get a mortgage, and uh, they got the mortgage from Sears, Roebuck and Company. But Sears, which was founded over 125 years ago, Sears was one of the ways that Black people got a chance to democratize um, retail, uh, retail uh, treatment that was in line with white people because black people could go and order off of the Sears catalog. That's right. And so they can order Sears catalog and the products that they would uh, get from Sears catalog would be shipped to the store where they would pick them up or the post office. And the products were just the same products as white people were getting the same price. Whereas before Sears catalog, black people had to go into back doors of white businesses. They would mm -hmm. pay higher prices and get lesser quality. Sears democratized that whole process. Such so much so that white business owners who were still crapping on black people, retailers, they said, we're losing black customers. So white business owners, what they did was they engaged in a propaganda uh, act, action against Sears. And what they started doing was, one, they started having Sears catalog burning parties where they burned the catalogs. And then two- Wait, wait, wait. There was burning books? Burning catalogs, burning books. That sounds very German, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Okay but they were burning catalogs, Sears burning catalog parties. And then they started publicizing the fact that Sears was owned by black people. 
Mm. So they were engaged in propaganda, misinformation. Again, we think about misinformation today. It didn't just start today. So the founders of Sears, okay, they literally had to publicize the fact that they were not black, they were white. Yeah. And, um, but they, they, they didn't do it other than to say, we're the actual owners of the business. But the white retailers knew that they could scare away customers if they showed that their business was black owned. So that has always been our legacy. And that is, while we do want to sell to the general market, we're challenged with, do, do we show that the business is black owned or not? Mm. Um, because we could lose white customers who have the money as a result of that. Makes sense. And so Professor Rogers, I thank you for taking the time to join us. We have one minute before we're scheduled to end. I wanna give the audience an opportunity to ask a question. So if you all have a question, you can raise your hand, you can type it in the chat and, or put it in the Q&A and I'll give you all an opportunity to do that really quick. Um, but Professor Rogers, as they do that, if they decide to ask a question, I wanna ask this final question. And so we, our history, the history of this podcast is a book club. And so I wanna ask you, what books are you reading right now or what books do you suggest that our audience take the time to read that would be beneficial to them? A okay. couple of books. One is, this is my book called Entrepreneurial Finance. It's the fourth edition. Um, so I recommend those who are interested in entrepreneurship to get this book because this book teaches the fundamentals of entrepreneurial finance. And as I said before, it's the fourth edition. Uh, the first edition was written probably 15 years ago. So it's the fourth edition. The other book that I am reading, or quite frankly, I just completed reading, is one titled The Warmth of Other Suns. Mm. And it's a book that was written by Pulitzer Prize winner uh, Isabel Wilkerson, a beautiful, brilliant Black woman who's a scholar, I think, at Boston University now. But this is a book, and that title comes from the poem, the title of a poem by Langston Hughes, The Warmth of Other Suns. And the book, if you, if you, the book, the book is about the migration of four million black people after slavery and beginning in 1910 to like 1950, four million black people from the South to the North and to the West. A lot of people know that black people migrated from the South, like my family from Louisiana, Mississippi migrated to Chicago. But a lot of people don't know there's a lot of black folks who migrated to the West, specifically to Oakland. Um, but this book is just absolutely uh, brilliant, phenomenal. Um, it was actually written 11 years ago, and she won every book prize that you could absolutely win from this 11 years ago. I went to see Isabel Wilkerson when she came to Chicago, uh, when she was talking to publicizing this book. Um, it took her 15 years of research to write this book. Um, so it's chock full of great research. It's easy reading. It's fascinating reading. And it's talking about this great migration of Black people through the lens of three Black families. She interviewed a thousand Black families and she settled on three Black families to tell the story about the great migration from uh, the South to Chicago, to New York and to Oakland, California by these three families. And it's chock full of great data and everything like that. I was telling a white colleague about the book yesterday I serve on the board of a mutual fund called Oakmark Mutual Fund. We have about $90 billion of assets under management. And I was talking to one of my colleagues yesterday who serves on the board with me. And she said, Steve, give me a book to read. I'm in between books. I recommended this book to her. And she said, uh, I'm going to read it. Then she, the, the next day she came in and she said, I looked up the book. And did you know that, I think it was the New York Times, uh, identified this book as the best nonfiction written book uh, in the country over the last 100 years. Wow. So it's a book that's about 500 pages long. It's the kind of book, you know, I go to bed at 10 o'clock every night, but by 10 o'clock when I was reading it, by 10 o'clock, I was like a child, you know, I don't want us to go to bed now, mom, I want to keep reading this book. So I would go to bed at 10 o'clock and all I could do was think about waking yeah. up so I could continue reading the book. So I strongly encourage the reading it. It's 11 years old. When I went to see Isabel Wilkerson 11 years ago, I stood in line for an hour for her to autograph three copies of the book. But I didn't read it until just now, this uh, recently. And the reason was my 84-year-old aunt sent me an email saying, there's a great book that I just read. You should read it. It's, it's similar to our family. 
the store. I got the book and I pulled it out and Isabel Wilkerson had autographed the book to Stephen, the grandson of Jimmy and Augusta Grant. This is your family story from Mississippi to Chicago. Wow. 11 years ago. Mm. It's a fascinating book. Everybody should read it. Man, you're going to make me pick it up. I know exactly where that book is in my office on the floor. <laughs> I feel bad that it's on the floor, but it's like on the floor in a pile of books that I got in my office. And I bought it like a year ago and I, I need to pick you it know, up. You'll love it. It's fascinating. Yes. So Professor Rogers and the audience, I thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope you all will join us again for our next conversation. Um, Professor Rogers, if you ever come to San Antonio, we, we should connect. I might even try to see if I can get you to come to San Antonio. Listen, I got one more question. Look, I got to ask this question. I'm reading the book. There are some icons in this book who are still alive. And I'm thinking about the tour that you did on HBCUs. And I'm thinking about Earn Your Leisure. Are you familiar with EYL? It's a, it's a group of brothers. You need to look at the EYL podcast. Because these brothers, they do conferences like all over the United States, younger Black brothers who are like really trying to get Black folks into entrepreneurship. But I don't think what's missing from what they do are the stories and the histories of the elders who have these um, firms that deal with endowments at universities. Like we're not even thinking in that way, right? And so I just have a challenge or hope or prayer, man, y'all should go on tour. Like this should be a group of you all who, who go on a lecture series around different cities and talk about what it was like to get to where you were at a time before social media because there's so much less visibility that gets right. put on you. Right. Um, and I think it would expand our view of the opportunities for, in, for entrepreneurship. But then also like, man, we started an endowment at, at a UTSA where I work for, for black student, black student initiatives, I'm like, yo, can I get that endowment to be managed by one of the funds that black people run? So I'm there just saying, just it would be great to just have like some platform where we could come see and hear you all stories. So again, thank you for coming. I, I appreciate you taking the time to be with us. And audience, if y'all give me two seconds, I'm gonna tell y'all what we got coming up next and uh, we'll be going for the day. My, my absolute pleasure. The only thing I ask in return is send me a t-shirt, an extra large t-shirt. Okay. You, you, University of Texas San Antonio or a t-shirt of any kind. I, I love t-shirts and the, all the t-shirts that I have are ones that have been sent to me. So that's, oh, yeah. that's the compensation that I'll ask for. Okay. Okay. For sure. Definitely. I appreciate it. I'll send you my address. All right. Thank so, you, Professor Clark. My pleasure. Thank you, Professor Rogers. And audience, once again, I'm going to ask you all to stay for one second, just so I can go over what we got coming up. I'm gonna share my screen. And so um, I have a Patreon where you can support uh, Entrepreneur Appetite ongoing. Uh, I'm count calling this initial group, the Founding 55. And so for $5 a month, you'll get access to all of our special events, um, our monthly book discussions, but then also the recordings, the podcast, um, and some, some other, uh, some other, content that we'll be producing for you all here in the future. As we move into next year, um, I'll continue to do these monthly live discussions, but I'll have other sessions that are pre-recorded that you all will get early access to. And the purpose of the Founding 55 is to help us hire an intern or a freelancer to help with the production of the show. And next month on Wednesday, November 16th, we're having our next discussion with Aria Holiday who is the author of By Black, How Black Women Transformed Pop Culture. And so we look forward to having you join us with that. Those of you who register, you'll get an email about that sometime this week for how you can register, or you can become one of our Founding 55 patrons, $5 a month, and you can get early access to all of our recordings and also get access to our live events. So again, thank you all for joining us. I appreciate you being here. And uh, you all have a good evening.